Welcome back to the Small College Basketball Podcast. My name is Chris Cottrell, and with more than 10 years of small college basketball coaching experience and entering our third season of full coverage here on the Small College Basketball Podcast, this is the only podcast with interviews, news, and highlights that celebrates the incredible coaches, players, and programs across all of small college basketball, celebrating NCAA Division II, NCAA Division III, the NAIA, the NCCAA, and the USCAA. Small College Basketball would like to thank Visit Central Florida for their support of the podcast and the Small College Basketball Hall of Fame Classic. Start planning your Central Florida vacation now at visitcentralflorida.com. That's visitcentralflorida.com. Welcome back to the Small College Basketball Podcast. Again, celebrating the uh, the best programs, the best players, the best coaches in small college basketball. We are, of course, grateful for our sponsor, Visit Central Florida. Start planning your Central Florida vacation now at visitcentralflorida.com. Visitcentralflorida.com. Go plan your Central Florida vacation. I'm getting ready for my Central Florida vacation. My buddy Wayne Cavati. I'm hoping he's going to be down there for his Central Florida vacation. We're both getting ready for the Small College Basketball Hall of Fame Classic uh, coming up in Lakeland, Florida, tipping off the NCAA Division II men's basketball season. Here to talk about it, Wayne Cavati. Uh, big day coming up this weekend, coming up tomorrow, uh, later today, actually, the Small College Basketball Hall of Fame Classic in Lakeland. We're going to get to that, but Wayne, Thanks for being here, and this is this is the start of a great season. Yeah, it, it's there's going to be a uh, a lot of new faces in a lot of new places, but a lot of familiar faces at the top. I have a feeling uh, when, when the season opens. So, as, as weird and as new as it may seem, I think there'll be a lot of familiarity uh, when when it's all said and done. And and listen, you and I have talked a handful of times since we saw each other last year at the hall of fame classic and every time we talk it's like just we're rekindling all this division two stuff all this basketball stuff it's like we've never stopped talking about it so we're going to talk about that hall of fame classic but i want to start off with um kind of like a no surprise poll right and i look at what was released from the college basketball nation earlier uh earlier in october and There's no surprises at the top. They have Northwest Missouri State number one. Of course, Northwest Missouri State, um, you know, national champions back to back to back and led by Ben McCollum. Like, where do you see Northwest Missouri State? Because they're really good. They've got West Dreamer back. They've got Bennett Sturts back. But like, where do you see them? I do. I think they're number one. Um, uh, You know, I, I did my preseason power 10 and I have them right up there. Uh, I know there's a that plenty of people could question that because of that upset to Southern Nazarene. Um, but you know that a they the Bearcats don't forget things, so that that they're, that's going to be looming large when they come into the season. But um, you, you like you look at the two teams that played in the championship, West Liberty and Nova Southeastern. You know there is so much turnover there, and, and we'll talk a little bit Matt more about them, I'm sure, in just a few minutes, but. When you 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 mentioned West Dreamer, you meant you mentioned Sturts, but you also have you know you have these Daniel Abreu, Isaiah Jackson, Mitch Muscari, Byron Alexander, all these guys that have played in two championship games, right? All these guys that were there for that upset last year, so they know how to win and they know how to rebound. And I think when you put that all together, you have to give them the respect of being that number one team in the country to open the season, and then we see what happens. I agree. I have them number one, you know, in, in in my thinking, I think with what they return, their depth of talent, Ben McCollum has proven that a, he recruits really well and B he's one of the best guard coaches in basketball. So when you have a guy like Bennett Sturts come in and play as well as he did as a true freshman in the small college basketball hall of fame classic last season, there's someone else coming right down the line to do that again this year. Um, I I think he's one of the best teachers in basketball. And I think they won't forget, like you said, I think Northwest Missouri state is coming into the season hungry and, and prepared 
to make a run and rebound from what might have gone on last year. Yeah, and and look, you know, you you could look at it one way. Yeah, they lost Diego Bernard, who was like the he was the guy from the start, right? Mm-hmm. The year before that, they lost Trevor Hudgens. The year before that, they lost Ryan Hawkins. And you can go with Joey Wittitz, right? Every year they lost not just like a good player or a top school. They lost one of the best players in D2 basketball. Yeah. And they just keep chugging along, right? And and you were talking about Sturts last year. I think the guy you got to watch is um, Jack Radigan, um, a, a redshirt freshman, that he could be that guy that steps on the court and all of a sudden is taken over the MIAA, you know? So they do have more depth, like you said, this year, and it's going to be interesting to watch. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think the depth is going to be really good. And talking about depth, you talk about a team who had depth last year, the national champion, Nova Southeastern. They had a ton of depth last year. This year, they've got three guys back. They lost all five starters. They go 36 and 0, they run the table, and they lose all five starters. I think I, I'm going to talk about this later, so I'm going to uh, tease it. But I think this is kind of the state of college basketball. With that said, you know, you talk about great recruiters, you know, Jim Crutchfield, one of the best recruiters that we've seen in Division Two, and his ability to teach his system. So where do you see Nova Southeastern? I actually have them at number three, right below West Liberty. Um, and, and it has a lot to do with you said with what you said. You know, may as well jump right in right now. West Liberty at least has two starters coming back, right? They had a, <laughs> yeah. they lost a lot, but at least they have two starters, right? Nova Southeastern has nothing, but, or they have the three guys, but when it comes to starters, all starting five are gone. But what you said is very true, and it goes back to Crutchfield, and this is a guy that's been doing this for, it feels like 20 years, right? 20 years, he's going to get the guys in that are going to make this the highest scoring team in D2, and it, and it, and he's going to find the right players because he's good at that. That's what he's good at. And you know, they got two big transfers in, in MJ Araldi and Ike Fuller. Uh, I think Isaiah Fuller was on um, Umzel last year. He had a great year. They made it all the way to the Elite Eight. You know, uh, so they got ballers there. They have some experience in the key role players. They're just going to have to step up into these expanded roles. And then you have Crutchfield. And, you know, and I'll give a shout out to Nick Smith, who was such a great guard for Crutchfield and, and now is the assistant coach there and part of the recruiting process, you know. It's great to have that kind of guy around. And and I think they're going to have some bumps and bruises to start the season as they mesh. When you're trying to gel 10 new players, you're going to have bumps and bruises. It's just the way it is. But I think by January, we're going to see a top five team in the country. I agree with you. And, and I think one of the great aspects of Jim Crutchfield is you just mentioned it. He's going to have 10 new players. Not only in his system is he going to have 10 new players. All those dudes are going to play significant minutes. And they're going to gel. It's not like he's bringing in 10 guys. They have three returners and he's going to have a seven man rotation. No. I mean, he does one of the best jobs in coaching of getting players to fit his system. So I think, no, I think Nova Southeastern is right up there. Um, I think they're a top five team. Again, at the end of the season, we're talking about them probably in the elite eight or in that, in that type of field. Absolutely. I would think so. And And it's a compliment to them because I think that, that South region is going to be a lot tougher this year too. And so to say that we still think that they're going to be back there says a lot about what we think about Crutchfield and the program. Yeah. Uh, the two starters you mentioned coming back for West Liberty, um, Christian Montague, Ben Searson, you know, they have two guys back. West Liberty goes to the national championship game. Um, and they've been really good for a long time under Crutchfield. Now under Ben Howlett, who played for Crutchfield, mm-hmm. you know, they're not going to la- they're not going to lack for power and speed and scoring. So West Liberty, you have them at number two. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and I think the, the college basketball poll had them at number three. So we all agree. They're a top five team coming into the season. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, you said you teased it a little earlier, but transfer portal here and, and they got three guys that scored double digit points and, you know, court that a um, Fergus, and Schuler, and um, they're going to be, they're going to fit right in. They're guys that that proven they can score at the D two level, and um, I think that's going to help them really mesh and, and turn around quickly. Um, but, but having those two those two starters in the lineup in the rotation with that that familiarity is going to be huge. Um, so I do think I think they're top five. 
and you know we keep we keep just talking the national championship game let's remember it was like the greatest national championship game in a lot it was so much fun to watch that game you know it's right up there with that finley buzzer beater uh about what 10 years ago 12 years ago whenever that happened you know it was one of the greatest games ever so these teams aren't going away just because they graduated people yeah you have two you two incredible systems uh the infrastructure for both those programs with their head coaches they're not going anywhere you know, I think especially if you got guys that can score, they're going to get shots off. Mm-hmm. You know, they're going to take advantage of turnovers. They're going to get shots off and they're going to score the basketball. I think I think what makes them dangerous is, A, they have really good players, but B, they are so hard to prepare for in league and then, you know, in the postseason play, whether it's your regionals or your Elite Eight, they're so hard to prepare for. It's you know it's a huge advantage for Crutchfield and and Coach Hallett at West Liberty. Number four, you have Indiana, Pennsylvania. Um, they lose their top three scores, but they return Porterfield, who's who's really good, twelve and six last year. Um, they've got good experience in the backcourt as well. Just like a lot of teams that we're seeing, you know, they've got to take on expanded roles. Yeah, and. But it's it's a different system, but what Coach Lombardi's established there. Process, right? This is a guy, it, it feels like 30 wins, you know, two loss season, 30 win season, it comes like that. And and it's again, he's finding the players. He has a couple transfers too. Um, and it's like you said, they have role players that are just gonna have to take on these expanded roles. And it, it always seems to work out that way because of the program he's built there. And you, you just especially in the preseason, you can't have a top five without IUP there, right? Like they have earned that, right? They are an elite eight threat every year. And I think with Porterfield leading the way, I, I think they're plenty experienced and they, and they have all the pieces in place to be the team to beat in the Atlantic region already. Yeah, definitely the team to beat. They've, they've played very well um, in, in the past. They are going to be what is probably going to be as full strength as they could be in the last couple of years, given some key injuries they had in the past. Um, team that's that's not losing a ton. A couple of teams that aren't losing a ton now, and they're going to be at, you know, five, six, seven, eight, where the College Basketball Nation poll and your thoughts at the Power 10 kind of conflict. But but I want to go to four and five because I think the are five and six. Those are two really interesting teams to me. Lincoln Memorial. Um, and, and Minnesota Duluth. Now Duluth has five starters back off a team that went to the elite eight last year. They yeah. are, they're, they're, I mean, they're really good. And it goes to show how good the central region was. They were the sixth seed and they made it to the elite eight. So Lincoln Memorial on the flip side of that, you know, they're going to return five guys who have played, you know, at least 20 games, as you said, in, in, in your post, um, why are these teams lower? Is there any rhyme or reason? I mean, I'm asking you. I don't think there is, but I just you got think, a different thought. I think in the – well, for Minnesota Duluth, I think uh, uh, right now in the preseason, to be perfectly honest with you, I think two through six, probably two through that Lincoln Memorial spot are separated by this much. And when it, when it comes mm-hmm. to that in a preseason poll and you don't have metrics and you haven't seen anybody take the court yet, you kind of go with – okay, what do we know from the past? And when you look at that, I, if, if we're being honest, Minnesota Duluth kind of the odd man out here, right? Like they just yeah, absolutely. upon this recent success. So you, you're down to West Lib, IUP, uh, Nova Southeastern and Lincoln Memorial who feel like they're in, it, it's like you're watching a repeat of the Elite Eight every year, right? It's always those four guys are right there. Um, and Lincoln Memorial, like you said, they have the experienced returners. Um, and that they, that's just what they do. You know, uh, I do miss the Lincoln Memorial Queens rivalry, but you know, right now it, I feel like the Southeast is, is theirs for the taking, but what it comes down to with Duluth is, uh, they're, they're a program that has been building and building and building. And it's like you said, they're not just five starters that are back. These are five guys that have played the last four years together. They have been there the entire time. This program has been waiting to get to this point. They made it to the elite eight last year. They're going to be hungry to get back next year. And they're not, and and you're talking about Drew Blair, right? One of the best in, in D2. You're talking about a guy like Austin Andrews, who's battled injuries, but he's still there and he's still going strong. Like they just have 
They have, they're one through five. They're all going to score double digits. They're all going to rip the boards. They're all going to play defense. They're a really dangerous team. Um, but when it comes down to why aren't they a little bit higher because of all the experience they're returning, you know, it, it just Crutchfield, <laughs> he earns that right to be <laughs> up there, you know, guys like that, Howlett, they just, they, they proved their, their, their system is, is almost, you know, player proof. It doesn't matter who's there is because when they bring those players in, they're buying into the system. And, um, but it's like I said, two through six are, are, are separated by a hair right now in the preseason. I think you're right. And, and I agree with that. I think honestly, two through six is a tier. I think seven through 10 is a tier. You know, when we look at Pembroke and we look at West Texas A&M, we look at central Oklahoma and Colorado Mesa in your, in your, in your power 10. I think those are a tier under themselves. And those top, those top 10 teams are not separated by much, but there are tiers. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and, and I agree with you. And I think I'm definitely hired on, um, Pembroke and and Mesa than a lot of other people will be in the other preseason polls that are going to start coming out. Um, but you know you're talking experience, and and that's why with those two teams, Colorado Mesa returned sixteen play, sixteen players. That's unheard of. Yeah. And yes, they're they're losing their best their best scorer from last year, but you know you you still got Baskin coming back, and and you have f- fifteen other players. You can't. That's invaluable, and. It, what you have to remember is all of a sudden the Armac is a D2 men's basketball power, right? Like there's yeah. all these yeah. teams there. So you have all this experience coming back in one of the toughest divisions. You got to, you got to respect that. And that goes for Pembroke as well. You know, they got Haskell, uh, Bradley Haskell and J- Jawan Carr back and they were their two top scorers. This is a team that dominates, you know, they seem to dominate the regular season. Um, they they struggle in the tournament in the past few years. They have, obviously they haven't made the elite eight, but maybe this is the year they do it with all this talent coming back. So, and then you know we could talk about West Texas A and M all day. We have last year at guard, the, guards, 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 guard. Coach Tom Brown's another one of those guys that you just respect what he does. And Larry Wise is back. I think he's a player of the year candidate. And I just think whoever they bring in is going to you talk about like Northwest Missouri. West Texas A&M has lost D2 superstars year after year after year, like guys that come in and set Lone Star records, and then they, they're they gone, and they just refuel. And, yeah, last year, if you remember the beginning of the season, they had a rocky road, but at the end of the season, yeah. they were right there, right? And, and I think that's what we're going to see again. And then uh, number nine, you mentioned Central Oklahoma. I'm high on Jaden Wells. They have a lot of returners as well. Um, they have a couple good transfers that are going to make this interesting. And I, I, that MIAA is going to be, it's going to be crazy to watch. And I, I think they're going to be one of the good teams there. Yeah. And out of the MIAA also have Emporia state pick number two, they return quite a bit. I mean, yeah. the MIAA, the RMAC are two of the better conferences, if not the two best conferences, probably right now in, in college basketball for NCAA division two team. I want to touch on real quick. Because we have you, you have UNC Pembroke at number eight. I want to talk about Augusta. They go out and they get a Division One win, you know, at the in the middle of October, end of October, and they lose Tayshawn Crawford, who you know was a beast inside, great interior play. But do they seem like they might have enough to be a contender in the Southeast? Well. You know, in all honesty, on paper, and when I'm doing my early season research and I'm I'm reaching out to coaches, I, you have no idea when you talk about a team that they're Nova Southeastern level and the talent that they've lost over the last two because they've been power yeah. the last two years. You know, we're talking about nationals runners up, national runners up just two years ago, um, and they're all gone. The Tyshawn Tyshawn Crawford's gone. You know, and. I, I didn't know you put it on paper and you, you can't even make a prediction. And then all of a sudden in their first scrimmage exhibition game of the year, they go out and they beat a D one school and you're like, well, I guess they still got it. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, I think they're definitely a top 25 consideration. I just think, um, you know, the reason I didn't have them in my top 10 right now is because I, I didn't see anything when it came out and then boom, you know, as, as soon as it's coming, um, they, they go and pull off this upset and it's great. And it, it's showing that they're a program that wasn't just built on a few players that took them to great heights and they're really starting something special there. And I think that's good for them. Yeah, I get, I, I agree. Dit Mitras does a really good job, really good coach. Um, played against them when I was at Lincoln, just 
no, Turf, uh, uh, what we're seeing and what I want to get to now is, you know, we're seeing the consistency in Division Two. Um, at the co, especially as coaches, um, there are more. I want to say more embedded coaches at Division Two probably than we see at Division One, and in terms of their longevity at their school, the impact they're having at their institution, I want to say Division Two, Division Three see more of that. There's more stability there for those coaches and the opportunity to build their program and navigate kind of this new transfer portal, this NIL. You cover Division Two, all things Division Two for NCAA.com. I want to talk about the depth of talent that we're discussing right now in Division Two. I, I think it's incredible. The depth yeah. of talent at Division Two basketball, and even if we talk some Division Three in the future, you know, Division Three basketball, the depth of talent that we're seeing is really better than it's been that I can remember. Um, I think the transfer portal has had a lot to do for do with that. And it's not necessarily a great thing. I understand the intent of the rule. I understand the impact that it's having. But I think it's made Division Two basketball really, really deep and really, really good. What are What's your takeaway on that? Well, one thing I'm seeing that's a little bit different with D2 basketball compared to other sports like D2 football and baseball in particular, mm -hmm. um, you're seeing a lot of transferring within the division. So these people that are good on – you know, we're, I'm talking about Ike Fuller, who I think could be a player of the year candidate. He went from Missouri St. Louis to Nova Southeastern. It's not like they were going, Nova Southeastern was going down the road to Miami and trying to take someone right. you know, from D1. But um, I think a lot of these transfers are staying within. So you talk about this depth of talent and at least they're kind of, you know, I don't want to say recycling, but they're, you know, they're coming, they're staying within the division. Whereas you know, D2 football, you, you kind of see guys trying to jump up a level and see what they could do. And I think with D2 basketball, um, it's not that they can't play at the D1 level, but they, it, you know, it's like some of these players realize, hey, Nova Southeastern can play with anybody in the country. Why not go play with them? West Liberty could play with any, you know, North, North, Northwest Missouri State, they don't do transfers, but just hypothetically speaking, you know, if right. someone wanted to transfer there, it's like they can, they showed they can hang with Duke one year, you know, it's like, yeah. why not go to these schools? So it, I think what deep two basketball does is it, it on the whole is it, it creates this environment where you want to compete with those top teams. So it keeps the transfers staying within the division and that keeps helping to build the depth. It shines light on these programs and it keeps bringing people to D2 and, and let's, you know, you have a podcast, right? When I started, this it, it was me and D two football and and a couple other local beat writers right. You have a podcast. There's the the football. Well, they do every sport, but like the D one rejects. You know, they, there's all this great coverage out there now. So when you start building these programs and you have all these regional, you know, conference podcasts all of a sudden popping up, things just start to grow and and people want to come play D two basketball. And I think that attributes along with the transfer portal. I agree with you. Attributes to this depth that just keeps growing at the D two level. Yeah, the staying power of the coaches, I think the impact that players can have when they when they move from school to school and the way that a lot of the top programs are taking care of their players. Yeah. I think that has so much to do with it. You look at the top programs in Division Two; they are operating as a Division One. They're operating with the player's best interest. Not that every school doesn't, but the haves, they have it in Division Two, And, and, and it, is, it is clear that they're able to maintain uh, and continue to build. So yeah. I'm excited about this season. I think division two is super deep, maybe as deep as they've been since we've been doing the podcast, but uh, talking about the depth, we have to get to, you know, the small college basketball hall of fame classic. We're going to be seeing a ton of talent this weekend uh, here in Lakeland, Florida. And when we talk about matchups, you know, John McCarthy put together the game card, the first game of the entire weekend is a top 25 matchup you got, you know, based on last year's ranking. You got Colorado School of the Mines and you got Bentley. Two teams that super high level academically and then super high level athletically. Like this, this game, I think, will set the tone for the weekend. And it's going to be terrific. Yeah, I mean, look, the, the small college, you, you know how much I love it. The small college basketball Hall of Fame Classic is the best way to start a season 
at any divi- at any division of co- it's great. It, it's it's always loaded field. It's these teams feeling each other out. Even you know, last year it was Northwest Missouri State, West Texas A and M, Lincoln Memorial, like Nova Southeastern, all these great teams, and nobody knew what to expect because you have all these great teams and you have no film to watch that's with the current team, and it's just going to be great basketball. And you know. Who knows what's going to happen? Anybody could beat anybody. Uh, you know, we had first round, uh, uh, first day upset last year. And and, and that's yeah. what makes it even better is that all of these teams, no matter how great they are, and they, are, I think all 10 of the teams in the field are really good teams, if not great, um, anyone can win, you know? And that goes down to, to Cedarville that's not in the rankings all the way up to you know number 11 or number nine in central Oklahoma so I think uh, anybody really could pull it out and I, I I think that's the best part about this this tournament yeah I, I I agree with you I love the depth that John puts together this year I think the only returning team that's played before or once is Florida Southern mm-hmm. so whole new list of schools whole new list of programs and What's what's kind of cool is as I'm watching courtside, coaches, players, they're trying to find their rhythm. They're trying to find that flow that we talk about towards that January, February postseason. They're trying to find it early and you have conflicting styles. You know, you got the RMAC going against each other, Colorado School of the Mines, you know, um, they, they all know how they play, right? So you have you know, all these, all these, these interconference rivalries, everyone knows each other. There's good familiarity. And then you go to this event and you got the best teams in the country. You know, I'm looking at central Oklahoma and Mercyhurst central Oklahoma can score the living, you know, leather off the ball. And then yeah. Mercyhurst is one of the best defensive teams in the country year in and year out. So what's that matchup look like that that could be, that could legitimately be a, a 30 to 29 game. <laughs> right. Yeah. Or it could be, it could be 70 to, it could be 70, right. you know, 70, 69. So you're like, are you taking the over or the under, but the matchups are so fun to watch because everyone's trying to find and play to their style and find their identity. Yeah. Um, you know, you mentioned that mercy here's team. I think that that's going to, they're one of those teams to watch, especially in that first matchup. Um, I think they were in the top 25, right. In that, in that first poll of the year. Uh, I have them in my top 25. So I definitely think yep. they're a talented team. And, you know, it. it and they got Central Oklahoma and, and Jaden Wells right off the bat. So you're going to see how good that defense is. But but again, it's what you said. It's, it's a blank slate. It's kind of, you can't predict the whole season on this, but it, it's, it is the, the great part of it is it's these, I love D2 sports, you know that, but the, the regionalization takes, once the, that starts, it takes away a lot. You don't see these schools. You you won't see Central Oklahoma get to play Mercyhurst or, or you know, uh, Colorado School of Mines play Bentley, who's, I can't even tell you how many miles apart they are, right? So I love that. that was, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, you got the em- Emporia State playing Pembroke. Again, they're they're too far apart. So I, that, I think that um, it's a good test for these schools to play, like you said, teams that they've never played against and really stretch and see what they can do. And you look at the schools that come out at, out of the, the tournament every year, and most of them wind up being tournament contenders because of that, you know, because of that early season test that they put themselves through. Yeah, the challenge. Um, you talk about some teams that are playing a, a ridiculous schedule. Lincoln Memorial, one of those teams that's playing oh. – a brutal non-conference schedule. Jeremiah Samaripas will have the rail splitters ready. But, I mean, the, the we talked about it. The depth of talent at Division II, the quality of coaching at Division II, you know, the teams that we see and we talk about, you know, year in and year out, I think are always at the top for those reasons. And the depth of talent allows for a, an upstart, you know, like the Florida Southern last year to jump up and upset someone. It's going to allow someone like uh, Umsel this year or like Cedarville this year to get off to a great start at the Hall of Fame Classic and mm-hmm. upset someone. So depth of talent division two, incredible this year. The the small college basketball Hall of Fame Classic, the matchups are going to be terrific on Saturday and Sunday this weekend. Wayne Cavati, give us – in our closing minutes, give us two or three player of the year candidates that are on your mind. Player of the year? Ooh. Well, I think you're going to see three of them. Uh, I think Jaden Booth on Florida Southern. 
uh, at Jaden Wells on Central Oklahoma and Zach Laput on Bentley. I think those three guys that are starting off the season uh, th- th- this weekend in the in the tournament. I think those are three contenders right there that you got to have your eyes on. But you know, you got to look. You got to look at the Bearcat guys. You got to look at West Dreamer and, and Bennett Sturts. Um, I you know I mentioned Drew Blair and, and Baskin on Colorado Mesa, but you know one guy that that's not in the rankings um on on a manual is is kj jones and, and i think this guy might be the best player in, in college basketball and uh, d2 college basketball this year yeah. he's he gets he's a better scorer every year and he's just and Emmanuel's a good team i think they're going to be really tough and i think he, he's gonna he's gonna get a, a lot of opportunity to showcase his skills this year yeah kj jones leading scorer in ncaa division two last season uh, back with Emmanuel after numerous offers to go elsewhere that uh, that we heard about. So really excited to see him at the Small College Basketball Champions Classic uh, two weeks from now. But Wayne Cavati, this has been a treat. We're coming up on our time, so I want to be respectful of you. Hope you have a great weekend at the Small College Basketball Hall of Fame Classic. And, uh, and to all the listeners out there, visit centralflorida.com. Go south. Get warm. <laughs> Thanks for having me.